Hi and welcome to episode 33 of the Tea and Possibilities podcast. I'm Nikki and this is a podcast all about knitting, crochet and making all the things here in North West London. You can find me online at hippie underscore Nikki on Instagram. You can find our Ravelry group if you search for Tea and Possibilities under the groups tab on Ravelry. And if you would like to see the show notes and find out more about anything I talk about on the podcast today, you can find them on my blog just below. I would like to say a massive welcome back to my returning viewers and another massive welcome to any new viewers. I always really appreciate you taking the time to give my podcast a shot and I really hope you enjoy it. It is another tea free episode this week. It is absolutely baking here in London, so I am all about a big pint of water. It is bank holiday weekend here, which means it is the Notting Hill Carnival weekend. Um, obviously, I am not there, I am here with you, um, but I am off to a post-carnival party this evening, and um, that's why I'm a little bit more done up than usual. I, um, because of the heat, was feeling pretty lazy and decided that rather than doing my makeup twice in one day, I would just put my party makeup on now and then I'm ready to go later. So <laughs> hopefully it doesn't just melt off. Before we go on to the episode proper, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to everyone who sent really sweet messages um, about Rich. Uh, for the, those of you who don't know, <laughs> I mentioned on my last episode that I was due to be going to Italy. Uh, I was supposed to be recording this weekend with a beautiful Italian tan and lots of stories about Italy. But unfortunately that didn't happen. Um, Rich, uh, very sadly, had appendicitis and the day before we were due to fly, he had to have an operation, which meant we had to cancel our trip, um, which was really sad, but mostly I was just really happy that it was nothing more serious than that. On the plus side, we have got all of our money back and we have rebooked for early September, so in a couple of weeks time, we will be back to Italy. Italy take two, wish me luck. <laughs> but now let's dive right in with Whipped Up. I only have three projects to show you this week um, because I spent a lot of time at the hospital and I didn't actually knit there. Um, I don't particularly like hospitals and I just didn't want to get my knitting out and I don't know, I was feeling a little bit squeamish um, so I did a lot of reading instead. <laughs> Uh, but mostly it's been the heat. I fully intended to get my Hortensia finished. I was going to get the buttons sewn on and lots of video to show you guys it fully finished. And I was going to work on the Shanghai stripes. Neither of which happened <laughs> because it's been so hot and I just couldn't bear having a cardigan or a blanket in my lap while I worked on them, let alone trying on a cardigan. So I stuck to my nice small summertime projects. First up is my sock head hat by Kelly McClure. This is knit out of La Vienna Me, um, the Merino High Twist sock in their Le Littoral base. And by rights, this should be an FO. Um, I, <laughs> I have been really enjoying working on this because it's just really simple stockinette, because the colour is beautiful and seeing it go from the skein to the hand wound ball to this final um, knitted piece has just been glorious and I really enjoyed it. Um, so I just kept knitting basically and if you have a look on my Instagram you'll see that I tried it on um, when it was about a centimetre away from the length the pattern stated it needed to be and I just had so much fabric um, at the back and I tend to wear my hats fairly high because I have a fringe. I don't tend to pull them down very low um, which I think is where a lot of the fabric would have gone if I wore it like that. And I just had this feeling of, if I close it now, I'm just going to end up with like a really long bit at the back and it's going to look like a Smurf hat. So I actually ripped out about three and a half inches and then started my crown decreases. And you can see I've started the crown decreases and it is significantly smaller than the one in the pattern. I'm just going to fold up the brim. So that's kind of how big it is going on my head. And I like a bit of slouch, um, just enough to get my hair up into, but mainly I don't like too much slouch. As I said, I don't want to look like a smurf hat. <laughs> um, 
So I started decreasing yesterday and I thought, I'm going to have this finished. It's going to be finished. I'm going to have an FO for the podcast again. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to this point and it's just a little bit uncomfortable um, to be working on the short circular. So I went and dug out my DPNs. Do I have a DPN set in the correct size? No, no I don't. <laughs> so I've ordered some DPNs and when they come, I think I've got about 10 more rows and then it's finished. Um, this I am really, really looking forward to wearing. I think it's going to be really lovely in the winter. I'm gonna put it on for you. There we go. So you can see, I'm just gonna have a little slouch at the back. Um, just about there, I would guess. I can't actually see, so I don't know if I'm guessing correctly. But yeah, this is about where I wear my hats. I don't really like them to be pulled any lower. Um, I would have just about enough room to put a, a little bun in. It's gonna be perfect. I love this color. I think it's really, really lovely. I love how light it is, how thin the fabric, fabric is, so it's not really hefty, and it's gonna be great for autumn. I actually forgot to bring uh, a hairbrush down this week, so I was really pleased with myself last time and I've forgotten again. So you are going to be stunned, stunned I tell you, when I reveal my second whip. It's a hat project! <laughs> um, this is, I think, my final hat for the time being, so when this one's done, you won't have to hear any more about hats. Um, this is the Fuego hat uh, by Justina Lokowska. It's knit out of Madeleine Tosh Vintage, um, Vintage DK, I think, and in the Candlewick colourway. I haven't made much progress on it from the last time you saw it. I actually ripped it out because I wasn't happy with it um, last time you saw it. So this is brand new cast on. And rather like the sock head hat, I thought I had the appropriate needles and I don't. So you have to go up a needle size um, once you have worked the uh, rim. And unfortunately, I don't have the next size up. So I'm just working on the rim at the moment and coming with my DPNs are the, um, is I should say, the circular needle that I will need to complete this. It is a really, really fun knit. It's got, I don't know if you can see, this twisted rib, these cables that start immediately. I love this colour so much. I would love a cardigan in this colour, but I have long accepted that it just, doesn't suit me because I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but I have checked in the mirror and it does reflect on my skin a bit like a buttercup. And if I had a whole cardigan in it, like I wish for, I'm gonna just look like I have jaundice. I will continue knitting in this color for people who can wear it and feeling wistful every time I do so. <laughs> so yeah, those are my two hat projects. And next up is a brand new cast on. This is the Colour Affection by Vera Valamaki. It's out of Stranded Dye Works Paradise Base, um, which Amy custom dyed for me in three beachy colours. And this used to be my Cornish Lily Pilly. Um, if you remember, this blue was going to be the lake section and the beachy stripes were, um, the beachy colours were the stripes in the Lily Pilly, and they're going to be striped in this instead. So I think I'm still gonna have that really lovely wave effect just in something that is a lot more fun for me to knit um, because I don't really enjoy lace, if I'm honest, and will hopefully be a lot of fun to wear. This is not for me. This is a Christmas cast on. Um, I'm just checking that no one's hanging around and can overhear this, but it's for my mum. Um, so hopefully she will love this. She has mentioned that she thinks the color is beautiful. So I'm really hoping that she will love it and that we'll get it done in time. This was an absolute joy to work on. I cast this on originally on the knit picks that I bought to take to Italy because um, even though we weren't going to Italy, I decided to cast it on with the wooden needles um, because it's not going to be finished um, very soon and I thought I could just get started with it and it would be ready to take to Italy when we rebooked. 
Unfortunately, I really did not enjoy working with the Knit Pros. I don't know if it's this particular fiber um, that didn't work for me on those wooden needles, but I just did not enjoy it. Um, I really enjoy the snippiness of metal needles. These are my Chalgu interchangeable set. Um, I have several higher hires. I have some Addies. Um, I like them all for various reasons, but I like the metal needles. That is what I like best. And this just flew along. This is the first wedge. It is gonna need a block, but yeah, I really enjoyed knitting this. It was something really really nice and simple to work on um, I was absolutely exhausted and it was something I could do quite mild mindlessly while we watched the film together I have been working on some other projects um, while um, I have been at home for a few days the first big one was my stash tidy um, I was actually going to try and film this and share share it on the channel just to give you an idea of what my stash looks like, how I was going to go about organising it. But it didn't quite work out like that. Um, I ended up doing my stash tidy while I waited for Rich to come home. One of our lovely friends went and picked him up. Um, so I was at home, kind of keeping the home fires burning. And um, to kind of put my mind at rest, I decided to stay busy and tidy my stash. And I very quickly realised that because we are not settled here. We are um, in a state of um, half unpacked, half packed. Um, I couldn't really put my stash away in the way that I wanted to, but it was really good to get it all out, to lay everything out and just to see what I had. Um, it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> I didn't realise how much I had. Um, I do have a lot, so I am very much on a not ban, not diet. I just want to be more mindful about what I'm buying because I do tend to buy things or pick them up at work because they're pretty. And that means I have a lot of very pretty skeins and not very many plans for them. So a lot of them got put into the prize pile. So there will be prizes for the best year ever cow. And a lot of them I donated to um, my nan who loves to knit and the rest all got put away with projects in mind. The Colour Affection is a great example of that. Now that the bulk of the work has been done with my stash, it's been edited, shall we say, I am really looking forward to when we get settled in our new flat, um, which will take the course of a couple of months, um, because moving is a bit of a pain. Um, I am really looking forward to getting it out, making sure my stash is really safe, moth-free home and um, is still an easy access for me. And I'm probably going to photograph it then and maybe do a bit of a video tour of my stash if that would be something you're interested in. So yeah, that kept me quite busy. I have also been bullet journaling a lot. I have been setting up some new things in my bullet journal which I am very excited to be filming. It's just a case of finding the time, if I'm honest. It's been, as you can imagine, a bit of a whirlwind week. There's been lots um, going on here that I won't go into, um, but it's been very busy. So I just haven't had the time to sit down, figure out a new setup just for bullet journal videoing. But it is coming at some point. But one of the things I really enjoyed doing over the last week or so is blogging. I have blogged for years, um, on and off, in various places. I love to write, and I have to say that I stopped blogging when I started podcasting. That was not a conscious decision, it's something that very much happened by accident, but podcasting um, does take up a significant amount of time because there is the preparation, there is the filming, there is the editing, writing show notes, uploading. It's, it's time consuming. I love it, but it is time consuming. And I found that um, after that, I didn't really have the time free to blog. I could have done, but it would have meant um, turning down going out or not knitting. And it just fell down a list of priorities for me. But while he was off recuperating and I was back at work, Rich actually edited some photos for me, which inspired me to get back to blogging. I shared a post on my 
um, little girl gang at blanket which if you remember is the really big um, reds and oranges uh, baby blanket that I made for my friend who was having a baby. This was obviously finished a long time ago so this FO post is very late in coming but I really enjoy putting it together. I am I hope more articulate um, in writing than I often am on here and it's quite nice to sit down and talk about the various things you had issues with or that you really enjoyed. To have that set down um, on paper, is that what you say when it's a blog? To have that written down <laughs> is really really nice. Um, I do attach the blog posts to the appropriate projects on my Ravelry page. Um, so if you did want to have a look, I will link it in the show notes or if you click on any of my projects on my Ravelry page, there's usually a blog post attached. Next up, I will be sharing my lovely dinosaur head on the blog um, and just talking about my process, um, the things that worked and things that didn't um, regarding that project. While I'm probably not going to blog about general things that come to mind anymore, um, I may do, but I have no plans to for the time being, I am going to try and stick to blogging my FOs. Um, they may not um, go up as quickly as they do on the podcast, but I do enjoy tracking them a great deal. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. One final thing before we move on to the next segment, Pom Pom Quarterly arrived. This, oh, I am dying for this. This is just so beautiful. It is autumn in a magazine and I love it. I um, would really love to put together a proper walkthrough review. If you would be interested in seeing that, please do let me know. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to talk about this a little bit more in Knit and Natter um, because I had a lot of yes moments reading this issue. Um, I heartily recommend you pick it up. It is such an inspiring issue, I can't even tell you. You should definitely pick up a copy of Pom Pom this month. But now let's move on to the spoilers. Yes, can you believe it? I am bringing back Here Be Spoilers. I have not had this segment for a very long time, usually because of time pressures. <laughs> I usually don't have time to talk about everything that I want to talk about. Um, but this week I really, really wanted to have a Here Be Spoilers section. I really wanted to have um, a chat with you about Game of Thrones. Um, I have been really enjoying the latest season. I have a lot of thoughts that I just wanted to share. So as the name suggests, there will be spoilers here. So if you are not caught up with the most recent season, of Game of Thrones. I think we're on season seven now. If you have not read the books but you intend to, please do skip ahead um, to the Knit and Natter segment because there will be spoilers here. I will put a note in the down bar so you know what timestamp is safe and you can just skip ahead. The reason I wanted to talk about Game of Thrones this week is because it is the season finale this bank holiday Monday. After the last episode, I, I'm i trying to be really circumspect here, even though I said that there are spoilers here. Um, but after the dragon incident, um, I am feeling very, very nervous. I was very agitated watching that episode, um, the big fight on the ice. I was there like throwing punches. I was going, no, fight back. You've got to fight harder. Um, I got very into it. Rich is a very patient man. <laughs> but let's go back a little bit because my introduction to Game of Thrones was actually via the books. I heard about this TV show. It sounded amazing. I had no way of watching it because I did not have Sky. I saw the very first book in the library, so I picked it up and fell in love. I probably read it in the space of a week and it's a fairly chunky book. I couldn't put it down. It was absolutely amazing. They didn't have the rest in my library. But a couple of weeks later, I found them in a charity shop, the complete collection for a pound each. That was about five years ago, and I burnt through the entire book series in the space of about two months. At the time, I was under the impression that The Winds of Winter, which is the next book in the series, was due out the following year. 
fairly early, maybe January or February. Unfortunately, that did not come to pass, and five years later, we're still waiting on the winds of winter. Side note, George, if you're watching, because I know how much you love these knitting podcasts, please, I, I realise you were a busy man, but I need that book. I've been waiting five years, George, just give me something. Rich then introduced me to the series. He had been watching it and was a big fan, but having read the books, I was just like, nope, it's not gonna be any good. There's no way it can match up. And then I watched it. Um, I was aware it was going to be a fairly good series. It had great reviews, but I did not think it was going to be a particularly good adaptation. How wrong I was. Um, I think particularly the first season is an excellent adaptation, to adaptation sorry, of the books and it has consistently, I think, um, done justice to the books. Even though, because the books are about that big each, <laughs> that's an exaggeration, but not by much, um, they are very long, they are very detail rich, they are dense, so something had to give when it came to the TV series, but I think they've been very faithful to the spirit of the books. We are now, of course, into post-book territory, so everything that's happening at the moment has not happened in book form yet. Again, another reason I am very excited for The Winds of Winter, because I am keen to see where that particular um, story goes, because it may go in a completely different direction. Game of Thrones does have its detractors. It is very graphic, it's very violent, there is a lot of swearing, and not just mild swearing, there is very bad swearing. Um, there is sex, violence, um, there's quite gory scenes, it is graphic. The thing that I was most squeamish about um, in the books was actually not the violence or um, the graphic sex scenes or anything like that, it was actually the age of the characters. Um, I believe Danny is about 14, um, possibly 13, when she marries Carl Drogo, um, or is married off to, I should say, that's slightly more accurate. Um, and that did um, leave quite a bitter taste in my mouth. Um, all of the characters are very, very young in the uh, book series, and they aged them up for the TV series uh, quite rightly. Um, however, it is directly influenced um, by the War of the Roses. Um, that was a period in history when people became adults very, very young, um, which I absolutely do not agree with. Um, but you had, for example, Margaret Beaufort, who was the um, mother of Henry VII. She actually had him when she was 13 years old. Um, they believe he was probably conceived when she was 12 um, because she was married that young. And Edward the Fifth, sorry, Edward the Fourth, <laughs> um, actually won his crown when he was about eighteen, and was considered to be a fantastic military leader even at such a young age. So it's not um, beyond the realms of possibility um, and believability when you read the book and you see that Danny is being um, married off at an incredibly obscenely young age and you have Rob Stark leading an army and being crowned king at 16. So, while I am intensely glad that they made a change to everyone's ages in the TV series, I also understand that it is inspired by a period of English history where these things did happen. But no, I did find that fairly difficult when I was reading the books, and to be honest, when I was reading, I pictured them a lot older because I just couldn't get my head around them being that young. Um, it helped that I'd already seen pictures of everybody who had been cast in season one um, who do look significantly older, so that is that did help. So yeah, that would be my one caveat about the book, um, that you might not enjoy that element of it. Um, but if you can get past that and the um, graphicness of the content, I think that um, you'll really enjoy it because it is an excellent story. It is rich and dense and it is so fantastically detailed and there's all these little throwaway things that come up later and you just go, oh my God, yes, that happened then. Um, 
It reminds me of Harry Potter in that way. Harry Potter is obviously a much more simplistic story in comparison to Game of Thrones because it was written for children, whereas Game of Thrones is not written for children in any way, shape or form. Um, but those little touches where you hear something in book one that becomes significant in book five, things like that, I absolutely adore and it's what makes rereading these books such a pleasure for me. One of the other things that I really love about Game of Thrones is nobody is safe. Um, reading the books you would be forgiven for thinking that Rob Stark is going to be this great um, hero, this king in the north who is going to ride into King's Landing and put the Starks on the throne of Westeros. Doesn't happen. I've got two words for you people. Red Wedding. Didn't happen. <laughs> Again, that was very graphic, um, very uncomfortable to watch, but I really do enjoy that nobody is safe. So when things happen, when there are big fights, you can't just sit back and go, well, you know, the extras are gonna die. No, nobody that we care about is gonna die. Um, so yeah, I really, really enjoy that. When you kick off a series by beheading your main character, before the end of season one, yeah, you set a precedent there. I do have to say that I think they've become a little bit more reluctant to do that in the most recent se series. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the last episode where none of the main characters died, even though there was a very um, sticky moment for me when I genuinely thought that Tormund was gonna die and I couldn't handle that because I love him. I think he's wonderful, I think he's gorgeous. <laughs> and I was very upset by the prospect of there no longer being a torment. Would I recommend Game of Thrones? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I would recommend Game of Thrones um, for several reasons. It is excellent storytelling, both in book form and TV show form. Um, really, truly very excellent storytelling, um, fantastic characterization, brilliant plot twists, detail, depth, so much, so much is fantastic about it. However, if you are at all squeamish about um, anything at all graphic, I would not recommend. Um, it is, even for me, um, and I don't consider myself particularly squeamish, there are moments where I'm just like, that's a bit much for me. Um, so if you do have any qualms about that kind of thing, I absolutely would not recommend it. If you love fantasy and you don't mind it, dive in, please. It is excellent. Fair warning though, you are gonna meet a dude at some point who's called the Night King, and he is genuinely terrifying. I have actually had nightmares about him because he scares me so much. I don't know why, he doesn't do anything that's particularly scary, but the episode, I think at the end of season five, Hard Home, when he just watched as Jon Snow and the rest of the Night's Watch sailed away, mm -mm. ever since, I just, I don't like it don't like it. I also really enjoy the theories that um, swirl around this TV series. Who do you think is going to end up on the Iron Throne? Um, what do you think this means? What does that mean? I love them. I never know whether to believe them or not, um, but I absolutely love them and I would love it if you would share your favourite theories just down below. Whew. <laughs> I got a little bit too excited then considering how hot it is. I'm already on my second pint of water. Let's, let's cool down with a little bit of knit and natter. On this week's knit and natter, I wanted to talk about capsule wardrobes. This is heavily inspired by the latest Pom Pom Quarterly, the autumn 2017 issue, um, where, let me just find the page, the Wonderful Animals has, as usual, a wonderful article. Um, also, I really love this illustration. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, the whole aesthetic of this magazine, as I've said, is stunning. But yeah, <laughs> we'll come to that when I review it. Um, but this article is called Loud Slow Fashion, and as I said, it's by Anna Maltz. Anna Maltz, basically, all her articles 
voice my feelings in a way that is so much more articulate than I could ever hope to be. And reading this article was no exception. I have tried the capsule wardrobe thing. Um, I have tried it two, maybe three times in the last few years. I originally tried it when I first moved in with Rich because we were very limited on wardrobe space. Um, capsule wardrobe is a very kind of new big trend at the time and I thought well I'll give it a go because worst thing that can happen is that we have a lot of space. Um, that wasn't the worst thing that could happen because I ended up throwing away all of my beautiful ditzy print dresses that I loved because I had this idea that a capsule wardrobe needed to be neutral and classic, um, which it kind of does because things have to mix and match a lot more easily um, and I got rid of all the things that weren't easy to mix and match and I have regretted it ever since. I tried again um, very briefly and got bored of it very quickly and then the last time I tried was before we moved to Portsmouth. Again it was um, that feeling of starting afresh, um, of wanting to edit down what I had. Um, I've spoken before about the fact that having too much stuff makes me feel quite anxious and that element of the capsule wardrobe appeals to me. However, it has never ever worked for me, ever. I have often felt like, wouldn't it be great if I could be very chic and very um, Parisian maybe, um, and very elegant. And I kind of had this idea in my kind of late teens, early twenties, that at some point in the future, that was just gonna happen naturally because I was gonna get older and I was naturally going to become this very elegant version of Nikki. Um, it didn't happen, as you can see. <laughs> um, I am not a naturally elegant or chic person. That to me is uncomfortable and a bit boring. Um, as you can no doubt tell from what I'm wearing, I like bright colours, I like swishy fabrics, I like to feel very comfortable, like I can move in things. I have fully embraced the soft bralette trend because they are so comfortable. And that's what I like. I really like to feel good and comfortable. I don't want to go out and to be constantly kind of adjusting what I'm wearing or having to be very careful of what I eat because I'm wearing white. Um, and that to me is what chic and elegant looks like. It's very pastel and plain and that's not me. I am fully aware that a, pas a pastel, a capsule wardrobe does not have to be um, plain and pastel. However, all of the inspiration I've seen online um, tends towards neutrals and plainer colours. Um, and so that's why I've just never managed to make it work for me because whenever I've tried to translate that to my own wardrobe, I really struggled because either um, I can't find anything I like or it means getting rid of um, really lovely bright things like this because they don't fit or they won't go with anything else and yeah that's why it hasn't worked for me up to this point. If you do know of any bloggers or YouTubers who have made capsule wardrobes with more um, variety without using the neutrals um, with more prints and brights that would be amazing and I would love to see it. I would absolutely recommend having a read of this article by Anna Maltz because it says what I'm trying to say now a lot more eloquently than I am. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on a capsule wardrobe. I still really like the idea of having um, a small wardrobe where everything can mix and match to make outfits um, that are fun and that you feel good in. However, as I have said, the idea of using paler colours and neutrals really doesn't work for me. It's not something that I am particularly drawn to. I wear brights or darks mostly and I am also not particularly thrilled by the idea of um, the number. I don't really like the limitation that that um, rigid number imposes on me. Um, for example, um, I don't like the idea that if I fall in love with a dress, um, in order to be able to treat myself and take it home, I'd have to take something out of my wardrobe to replace it. 
Um, I don't think that I have an exhaustive amount of clothes, um, so I don't think that that is a diet <laughs> that I particularly need to go on. Um, what I have been trying to do with the wardrobe project, which I have been working on um, privately um, while I try to figure out where my style is at the moment. Um, last year I spent a lot of time in office attire, which left me this year when I was able to wear whatever I want at a bit of a loss because I wasn't sure who I was um, sartorially anymore. Um, so I've been doing a lot of pinning on Pinterest, a lot of editing of the board to see what my kind of overall look is um, to guide me when I do go shopping because I don't go shopping that often because I don't enjoy it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really don't like the limitation that it places on us. Um, I like the idea that I can buy a really plain dress and dress it up with um, a cute handmade cardigan or some really big earrings um, and things like that. I am also super into layering, not this time of year because it's boiling, have I mentioned? Um, but I really like layering things up. Um, I don't really have a winter wardrobe. I tend to wear my summer clothes with extra layers. What I am taking from the capsule wardrobe um, attitude though is this idea that everything in your wardrobe needs to earn its place. Um, at the moment, as I've said, um, we aren't fully unpacked. I don't have a wardrobe at the moment. I have a lot of drawers, um, which is not quite so easy to see everything that I've got. And one of my big projects that I'm very excited about when we move is setting up my wardrobe, um, getting everything hung up and making it really easy to use. And also in filling that, I'm gonna look at things and say, do you, do you deserve to be here? Do I like wearing you? Do you fit well? Um, do you make me feel good? Did I forget that I had you? <laughs> which is usually an indication that you probably don't love it that much. Um, so I'm very excited about my very real wardrobe project that's coming up. Um, but I do really recommend you have a read of this article by Anna Maltz. I would love to hear if you are a capsule wardrobe lover, if you think that it's absolutely amazing and it has really, really helped you and you've never felt more free, please do tell me why. What am I missing about the capsule wardrobe? Again, as I said before, if you know any bloggers who um, don't go down the neutral and fairly plain route that most capsule wardrobe blogs I found, um, seem to go down. I would love, 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 love to see that video, to read that blog, so please do link it for me. And finally, if you are not a capsule wardrobe person, if like me, you are a bit of a capsule wardrobe doubter, let me know why. Why does it not work for you? Because it might not be the same reason that it doesn't work for me. That's it for this week, guys. I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you, um, particularly about the capsule wardrobe thing. Um, let's open up a thread in the Ravelry group where we can chat there. Also, I am really excited to have brought back Here Be Spoilers. I had forgotten how much I love um, blathering on <laughs> about my favorite books and TV shows. One of the questions that I had um, in my 2000 subscribers giveaway um, thread was, is Harry Potter my favorite book? And while it is incredibly formative and has a very, very strong place in my heart, it isn't my favorite. <laughs> um, it is my favorite in many ways, but I think if you were to ask me what my number one favorite book was, as I said in the last episode, it would be Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. Um, but it's just really exciting for me because I name drop Harry Potter all the time. So it's really lovely for me to bring back that segment and talk about stuff that isn't Harry Potter, <laughs> which I'm sure you're happy about too. Um, so if you enjoyed that, please do let me know. And I am very, very happy to be sharing more Here Be Spoilers with you in the future. There are a lot of TV series that we work our way through. We watch a lot of sci-fi films and I read a lot. <laughs>
In the meantime, that was supposed to be me winding down the episode, but I've just started talking about books again and got distracted. <laughs> I will wish you a absolutely lovely couple of weeks. I will see you very soon. In the meantime, take care and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. I will continue making this colour out of people who can wear it. That's not what I mean. That sounds weird, doesn't it? No. Let me do that again. <laughs>